In this video, I present five reasons that might suggest that John knew one or more of the Synoptic Gospels, namely Mark, Matthew, or Luke. The strongest case for a relationship can be made between John and Mark rather than John and Matthew or John and Luke. And so what you'll find in this video is that the relationship between uh, John and Mark or the potential relationship between John and Mark is sort of centered here. What I want to do is begin with a lecture pause to get you thinking about John's relationship to the Synoptic Gospels. So I want you to pause the video and make a prediction here. I want you to jot down three reasons that you think that scholars might suggest that John knew the Synoptics. So we're making a prediction about the kinds of uh, reasoning or the lines of argumentation that might be used to suggest that John knows Mark, Matthew, and or Luke. So go ahead and pause here. And once you come back, we'll see if any of your guesses align with what I give you here. All right, so with respect to our fifth reason, Mark had already been utilized by two other authors when the Gospel of John was composed. And this is the case under either of the major solutions to the synoptic problem. In both the two source theory and the Farrer theory, Mark has been rewritten by two different authors, Matthew and Luke. This reveals the profound influence of the first written gospel. Must, Mark must have been really well known or very well known by the time John was produced because it was used twice over. That both Matthew and Luke use Mark also suggests that this particular gospel, Mark, was conducive for reuse and rewriting. A precedent had sort of already been set for incorporating older written Jesus traditions into new ones by the time John was written. And there was a vast range of strategies for using and rewriting ancient texts. And so we shouldn't assume or expect that John's relationship to Mark is going to mirror Matthew's relationship to Mark or Luke's relationship to Mark. John might have a different literary relationship to Mark than do the other synoptic gospels. And I think we can press this claim just a little bit further. If John knows the way that Matthew or Luke uses Mark, then John is actually going to be even less likely to use Mark in the same way. That is to say, if uh, John knows that Matthew and Luke are using Mark in a certain way, John is probably going to use Mark in a different kind of way. Excuse me there. Number four, we have the early Jesus movement was relatively small, well-networked, and mobile. If Mark circulated widely and it was a watershed for the transference of these oral Jesus traditions into a written mode, then it's likely that the author of John would have been aware of this sort of literary textual development. News of Mark's written gospel would likely have reached the author of John. This is because travel routes, travel routes were really well established in the first century Roman world, and the New Testament documents themselves claim that the leaders of this movement were itinerant. That is, they tra transversed across the empire, traveling about. News and information could spread relatively quickly between the congregations in the great cities of the empire, and from there, outward into the surrounding regions. That mark could have existed for several years or even decades, that is, from its composition around 70 CE to John's composition around 90 CE, without John knowing of Mark and having access to Mark seems to be a bit unlikely. Third, unlike the Synoptic Gospels, John does not indicate what kind of text it is at its beginning. Mark, Matthew, and Luke all label themselves. Mark calls itself a gospel, Matthew calls itself a book, and Luke has a literary preface that implies that it is an orderly account. If the fourth gospel was wholly unaware of the synoptics and it independently wrote independently wrote a text that contained Jesus traditions, then the author would have considered what they were doing to be an innovative act. In that situation, we'd expect the author of John to give us some indication about what kind of text followed. So if John is uh, sort of doing something new, we'd expect at the beginning for him to state what kind of text uh, he is writing. 
but he doesn't. Instead, the fourth gospel presumes that its audience knows something about its contents and genre, sort of uh, just by jumping into the prologue, it assumes a knowledge uh, or a familiarity with something that is gospel-like. And the best explanation for this kind of an assumption is that the author and the audience do have comparable experience with other written Jesus traditions, such as Mark, Matthew, or Luke. And John 1 1's in the beginning also appears to be riffing on Mark 1 1's the beginning of the gospel. In Greek, that word beginning is identical just as it is in English. On to number two here. John follows the overarching structure of the synoptics and shares pretty important material in common with them, even when it's not necessarily in the same words. And sometimes we do have same words that are overlapped between John and the synoptics. In both John and the synoptics, Jesus' ministry begins with the preaching of John the Baptist. In the middle of the narratives, we have Jesus performing miracles in the case of the synoptics, or signs in the case of the fourth gospel, and teaching uh, in sort of different kinds of ways in the synoptics in John, but teaching nonetheless. And then we find that each gospel sort of concludes with this extended passion narrative that really takes up uh, the bulk of the story in which Jesus is crucified in a specific place, namely outside of Jerusalem. And what this shared structure suggests is that in a, there's this sort of essential continuity between John and the synoptics. There were lots of different ways one could have written up Jesus' traditions without following that structure. Uh, and we see this, for example, in other extra or non-canonical Gospels, something like the Gospel of Thomas, which is just a list of Jesus' sayings. So this sort of way that John is structured in a way that is similar to the synoptics suggests that he is familiar with them rather than sort of just by chance John and the synoptics come up with a very similar structure to one another. And our number one reason here is that John makes several statements that seem to make better sense in light of the synoptic gospels. And this is the foundation upon which Richard Bauckham uh, builds his argument in a chapter called John for Readers of Mark. He cites two different what he calls parenthetical explanations for which knowledge of Mark seems to be presumed in the Gospel of John, but isn't necessary for that portion of the Gospel of John to make sense. So these parenthetical uh, explanations, for those who have read Mark or another synoptic gospel, uh, they sort of supplement John in a way. They, they can make sense, um, they can make better sense of John, and they can make better sense of the parenthetical explanation if the synoptic gospel is known, but one doesn't need the synoptic gospel necessarily for that part of John to make sense. It might be a little bit uh, odd, but it doesn't sort of throw off the entire narrative. And so there are two of these that Bauckham calls attention to. The first one is in John 3.32, which states that John the Baptist had not yet been thrown into prison though John, the author, uh, has not yet said anything about John's imprisonment. So it sort of just uh, is out there without, uh, without any previous knowledge of John's imprisonment in the narrative of the Gospel of John itself. What we find in Mark 1.14 is that uh, Jesus' Galilean ministry occurs after John the Baptist's arrest. And so what Richard Bauckham argues from this is that John 3.24 uh, not only is sort of alluding to John's imprisonment from Mark, but the comet is doing even more than that. It's The comet is sort of meant to situate Jesus' Judean ministry at a different point in time than the Galilean ministry that's relayed in Mark. So the Judean ministry that's recounted in the Gospel of John occurred before Jesus' arrest, while the Galilean ministry recounted in the Gospel of Mark occurred after John's arrest. So the first part of of the Gospel of John is being set in a particular time that precedes anything that is narrated in, uh, in the Gospel of Mark. And Bauckham's second parenthetical explanation is from John 11:2, which tells the reader information about Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, uh, and it sort of gives information when she first appears in John's narrative. When she first appears in John's narrative, John states that she was the one who anointed Jesus with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. The problem here, or the sort of... Uh, 
the incongruity, we might say, is that this episode, the anointing of Jesus, doesn't happen in the Gospel of John for another chapter. Uh, so that's not going to happen until John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, yet John refers to it here. So there's sort of two options. The first option is that John is looking forward. He's referring to something that is going to be written later, up, later on in the Gospel, namely one chapter later, or the other option is that he is referring back to the account in the Gospel of Mark, where an anonymous woman anoints Jesus. And you'll see if you look closely at the two texts there, there are some sort of differences in how the anointing happens. Uh, but so those are the two options. And Bauckham is going to say that because John doesn't do this sort of forward-looking thing for characters elsewhere in the gospel, it doesn't make sense that he would be doing it uniquely here. More likely, John is taking an anonymous character from the gospel of Mark and giving them a name in the gospel of John. All right, so to uh, zoom back out to all five of our reasons here. And these are, I should say, are not the only five reasons that some biblical scholars claim that John either knows or makes use of Mark or the other synoptics as well, but they are five of the best reasons, in my opinion. I think it's also important to state that it is not the position of all biblical scholars that John knew Mark. In fact, uh, sort of the majority position for most of the 20th century was that John was wholly independent of Mark and all of the synoptic gospels, that John uh, either has never seen the gospel of Mark, has never seen the other synoptic gospels, or is uh, sort of wholly ignorant of their existence at all. It's only been in recent years that there's sort of been a reopening up of this question of the relationship between John and the Synoptic Gospels. And really, uh, in the last decade or so, there has been sort of uh, a, a growing number of biblical scholars, still probably in the minority, um, but a growing number of biblical scholars that do, in fact, think that John knew at least Mark, if not also Matthew and Luke. 